Welcome back. So in this particular video lecture, we will look at condensers. Condensers, they are one of the major components of our refrigeration and air conditioning system. And so in this particular video lecture, we will see what a condens condenser exactly does. Okay, so this is our pH diagram for a vapor compression refrigeration system. So if you look at this case, the point number one, which is at the exit of the evaporator, it is in the superheated state. Okay, and so when the exit of the evaporator, you have the refrigerant vapor in the in the superheated state. Obviously, at the end of the compression, it is going to be in the superheated state as well. Okay, so your point number two at the end of compression that is also in the superheated state. So if you uh, if you want to have a recap of what it is all about for a vapor compression refrigeration system. You have the evaporator, which is the actual refrigerator or the cold region of space or the region that needs to be cooled. So your refrigerant liquid enters the evaporator. That is your uh, condition number four and it leaves as condition number one as refrigerant vapor and then it enters a compressor. So that is your compressor. And so at the exit of the compressor, you have state point number two, and then you have the condenser. The exit is at state point number three, and then you have the expansion valve. So after which you have the condition number four. And what we know is at the entry of the evaporator, it is going to be a low pressure, low temperature refrigerant liquid. After absorbing or removing heat from the region of space that needs to be cooled, it gets converted into a low pressure, low temperature refrigerant vapor. So here the heat removal is a latent heat removal or the latent heat of vaporization where your refrigerant liquid gets converted into refrigerant vapor and then it is taken to a compressor where it is compressed to a high pressure, high temperature refrigerant vapor. And so it is the role of the condenser where again the high pressure content, high temperature refrigerant vapor is converted back to a high pressure, high temperature refrigerant liquid. And then it is the role of the expansion valve which reduces both the pressure and the temperature where your enthalpy is constant, which is an isenthalpic process. And it is usually, uh, it usually happens in a capillary tube and other expansion devices like uh, thermostatic expansion valve and uh, other devices. Okay, so now our concentration is here on the condenser. So we have said the condition at the exit of the evaporator that is in the superheated states so obviously at the end of the compression it is much more in a superheated state so from here from two to a state of four or five if it is going to be four then your point number four lies on the saturated liquid line where the condens the condenser results in a refrigerant liquid whereas when it goes to five then it is subcooled to point number five or the state point number five. OK, so what happens in the condenser? So here at point number three, which lies on the saturated vapor line. So between two and three, what happens is de superheating. So uh, at that particular condenser pressure, when I reduce the temperature and it comes back to the saturated state and that is the saturated vapor state. And so this process two, three is superheating. And then from three to four, it is again latent heat of condensation over here where your uh, vapor gets converted into liquid, which we usually call as HFG. So this is your latent heat of uh, uh, condensation. And then from four to five, you have subcooling, OK, where further removal of heat uh, takes the liquid to a compressed liquid state or a subcooled state. OK, and why do we prefer that? For example, let me say if I have uh, uh, the condition at four, so the cycle would end here at say, let me say seven. 
okay so now when my uh, the condenser at the exit of the condenser when the position is on the saturated liquid line so the refrigeration effect happens to be h1 minus h7 okay whereas if it is on the subcooled state when it is on the subcooled state say 5 and so the corresponding expansion leads to 6 so the refrigeration effect is now h1 minus h6 and you can very well see that this red color one which i have written h1 minus h6 this is greater than h1 minus h0 so obviously the refrigeration effect is greater when the refrigerant liquid leaving the condenser is in the subcooled state so it is preferred that at the end of the condensation process in the condenser it is preferred to have a subcooled liquid refrigerant so that my refrigeration effect is more which means the capacity of heat removal in a particular refrigeration system is more so this is what a condenser exactly does okay and so let's look at what are the factors that are used for selecting the condenser capacity okay so here in this particular a case in the in this scenario we are looking at three factors one is the material so the factors that is uh, uh, affecting your selection of condenser one is your material so the size of the condenser it depends on or it is varied depending upon the different materials that you select that is the material that has got higher ability of material uh, high, uh, higher the ability of material to transfer heat say for example if your thermal conductivity is more okay so if the thermal conductivity of the material is more then i need not go for a higher heat transfer area it is sufficient to have a material with higher heat transfer capacity or high thermal conductivity so that the size of the condenser is small so your selection of the condenser depends on the material the ability of the material to conduct or transfer heat okay so that is one one criteria the second criteria is the amount of contact so the amount of contact depends on your heat transfer area so if you increase the surface area of heat transfer then you are going to have high heat transfer rate okay so that can be done either with the help of uh, finned tubes uh, the tubes that have fins so you can increase the surface area okay so how much contact is there between the condenser surface and the medium that is going to condense in this case it is going to be the refrigerant vapor okay so you can do that either by increasing the surface area of the condenser or the rate of flow of the condensing medium over the condenser surface so if the rate of flow is small okay the mass flow rate is small if the mass flow rate is less so it will uh, the it will be in contact with the condenser surface for a prolonged period of time wherein it can remove a large amount of heat so either you can increase the surface area of the condenser or you can decrease the mass flow rate of the refrigerant that is flowing over it okay and then it also depends upon the level of the liquid refrigerant so in the previous slide we talked about de superheating so uh, we can just go there for a second the previous slide see in the, in the condensation you have three parts one is your de superheating so when it is in the de superheating region now the re refrigerant is in the vapor state so this is some sort of a sensible heating where the temperature of the superheated refrigerant vapor is reduced to its dry saturated state okay and then it moves from three to four it is latent heating where the temperature remains the same but what happens is your refrigerant vapor gets converted into refrigerant liquid then once again between four to five that is again sensible cooling so two three is sensible cooling where the temperature of the superheated vapor is reduced to the temperature where your 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 vapor is in the dry saturated state and in four five you are reducing the temperature of the refrigerant liquid to that of a compressed liquid okay so uh, these are three states so between two and three it is going to be refrigerant vapor so between two three it is refrigerant vapor between three and four it is going to be both liquid plus vapor and between four and five it is going to be refrigerant liquid only okay so your condenser is supposed to reduce the temperature of the refrigerant in all these three different phases in the sense 
the phases in the sense three different stages let me not say phases let me say stages okay so the first stage it is going to be reduction of temperature in the vapor in the second stage it is going to be conversion of vapor to liquid and the third stage it is going to be reduction in the temperature of the liquid so when you have the level of the liquid refrigerant that is um, that is less or that is more that is going to play a role in the uh, amount of contact between the vapor refrigerant and the condensing medium if more liquid refrigerant is in contact then it is not possible for the vapor refrigerant to get converted into a uh, liquid back okay so that scenario needs to be adjusted the portion of the condenser used for liquid subcooling cannot condense any vapor refrigerant so that is what i said so when you have more of a liquid then it is not possible for the vapor to get converted into liquid because more of the liquid is in contact with the condenser surface okay so so it has to be designed in such a way that all the three stages of condensation is taken care of okay then the third factor that is going to affect is the temperature difference okay so obviously in any heat transfer process it is going to be your uh, heat transfer capacity the heat transfer ability or the surface area and the third one is your temperature difference so the heat transfer capacity of the condenser it depends on the temperature difference between the vapor refrigerant and the condensing medium so higher the temperature difference higher it's going to be the heat transfer rate and if the heat transfer if the temperature difference is more then the capacity of converting the vapor refrigerant to vapor liquid refrigerant in a particular condenser that is going to be more so the temperature difference cannot be controlled why it cannot be controlled because uh, if i need to convert a particular uh, vapor into a liquid then it refer, it requires a particular temperature difference i can't alter that okay so that temperature difference cannot be controlled and most air cool condensers they are designed to operate with a uh, temperature difference of around 14 degrees centigrade so the factors that affect the condensers they are either materials or the temperature difference or the amount of contact of the condensing medium along with the condenser surface okay then we we'll look at something called this heat rejection factor okay so the heat rejection factor it is defined as the ratio of the condenser the load on the condenser per unit refrigeration capacity what is this load on the condenser the load on the condenser is nothing but the summation of your refrigeration effect and work input to the compressor okay so that's going to be h1 minus h4 so that is your refrigeration effect and work input to the condenser is h2 minus h1 okay so the summation of this this is going to be the load on the condenser your so your heat rejection factor which is denoted by hrf that is nothing but the load on the condenser divided by the refrigeration effect so this entire term divided by the refrigeration effect h1 minus h4 so this guy is nothing but 1 plus h2 minus h1 divided by h1 minus h4 so h1 minus h4 by h2 minus h1 is cop so now it is h2 minus h1 by h h1 minus h4 that is 1 plus 1 by cop that's it okay so that is your heat rejection factor so that is one particular terminology which they come across in specifying the condenser okay so there is one note over here so in the actual air conditioning applications for the refrigerants particularly r12 and r22 the usual operation temperature of the condenser is 40 degree centigrade and the evaporation temperature is 5 degree centigrade in this particular scenario the heat rejection factor is 1.25 okay so this is um, as something which can be uh, calculated upon then classification of condenser so there are going to be three uh case uh, uh types of condenser one is your air cool condenser water cool condenser and evaporative condenser so obviously in air cool condenser the condensing medium uh it's going to be air and in a water cool condenser it is going to be water and what about evaporative condenser we are going to use both air and water so based on the condensing medium we can classify condensers as air cooled water cooled and evaporative so let's start with air cool condensers over here okay so let me take this over here so in case of air cool condensers okay so here you, uh, i have shown you uh, in this particular picture you can see this is the condenser coil uh, where the hot vapor refrigerant enters from the compressor and it flows through the tubings 
okay in this case what is shown as a serpentine tube so not necessarily a serpentine serpentine tube always it can be straight tubes also or sometimes it is a uh, some sort of a uh, hairpin bent tubes so when you have you can have hairpin bent tubes or you can have serpentine tubes you can have straight tubes all these different types of tubings you can have okay so the point is you have vapor hot vapor refrigerant entering from the uh, compressor it flows through the condenser coil which is nothing but a set of tubes and it leaves out as cooled um, liquid refrigerant it enters at vapor refrigerant it leaves as liquid refrigerant okay and in between something happens and that is what the condenser does it converts the vapor refrigerant into a liquid refrigerant okay so that is by removal of heat so here the air is passed over the tubes in most of the cases it is borne from bottom to top so that the heat carrying capacity is more and um, in the process your vapor refrigerant gets converted into liquid refrigerant and you can see that in many cases you either use steel or copper tubings and the size of the tube it is in the range of 6 mm to 18 mm outer diameter and in most cases copper is preferred because of its high heat transfer ability the thermal conductivity of copper is high and they usually prefer copper however uh, in the case of ammonia refrigeration system ammonia it's capable of corroding copper so, so the copper is not a material that is suitable for ammonia refrigeration system so in case of ammonia refrigeration system people always use steel tubes okay and you can either have fins in the tubes so fins provide uh, additional heat transfer area and that will enhance the uh, heat transfer capacity of the condenser uh, which will further reduce uh, which will quickly convert your refrigerant vapor to refrigerant liquid okay and then you can also have these fins they can be made out of aluminium or uh, usually a lightweight material for that matter and the fin spacing is wide so uh, they usually keep it as wide in order to avoid the clogging in this case it is going to be air so it should not be a matter in case of air but but when it is going to be some sort of a liquid like a water cooled condenser then in that case in case you have impurities or salt water the deposition it can result in uh, clogging so people normally use wide spaced uh, fins and that also results in a lower pressure uh, pressure drop enhancing the flow of the fluid and though that is a matter of uh, though that's not a matter of concern in this particular case okay so you you will have fins to enhance heat transfer and usually uh, the fin spacing is wide okay and these air cool condensers they can be classified into two one is your natural convection air cool condenser and the other one is forced convection air cool condenser so what is shown here in this particular picture over here is a natural convection air cool condenser you can see the vapor refrigerant entering from the top so the vapor refrigerant enters from the top it goes through the tubes this is one tube this is second tube this is the third tube and you can see that there is a fan over here and i am blowing air over this so this is some sort of a cross flow over here air is uh, uh uh blown with the help of a motor so if if motor is used then it's not natural con uh, it's not a natural convection so it is obviously a forced convection i i previously told you that it is a forced con uh, natural convection the moment you see that there is a fan it's a forced convection i didn't mention it i'm sorry about it so this is a forced convection air cool condenser i blow air over it okay and this air which is blown over this tube which carries the vapor refrigerant removes heat from the vapor refrigerant and when heat is removed from the vapor refrigerant the vapor gets converted into liquid and that liquid refrigerant is collected in the receiver and then it is taken to the expansion valve where its pressure and temperature can be lowered further okay so you can see that uh, this is this is uh, there are three tubes that are shown in this diagram so as air passes through the first tube it will remove some amount of heat so now the air is heated a little bit then it goes to the second tube more amount of heat is removed now the temperature of the air is higher and then it moves to the third tube much more heat is removed so the air that is leaving out it is removing a large amount of heat and the temperature of the air is high so the temperature of the air rises as it, as it passes through each row of tubing 
okay and the temperature difference it decreases in each row of tubing and because it will be able to absorb more heat in the first tube as compared to the second tube now the temperature of air is higher so its capability of removing heat becomes less it will be able to remove only a little amount of heat over here in the second tube and here it will be much lesser so the heat carrying capacity of air reduces as it passes from one tube to other tubes but if i have a single tube then it should be a very lengthy single tube and that is going to increase the size of the condenser so i need to have multiple rows of tubings in order to reduce the size of the condenser and there is a limitation for that also either you can have two or more and not more than eight rows if you are going to have more than eight rows then that is also going to result uh, in a case so when the air so just like in this case as it passes through the first tube second tube third tube in case if you have eight tubes as it passes through the eighth tube the temperature of air and the temperature of the uh, refrigerant that passes through the condenser they may be almost the same and so it will not be an efficient way when you have more number of tubes and the heat removal rate or the heat removal uh, with the help of air it is going to be less so the efficiency of the condenser will be less when you have more number of tubings okay so as i said if you can either have a natural convection uh, air cool condenser or a forced convection uh, air cool condenser so what is shown here is a natural convection air cool condenser you can see the cold air that is entering from below it uh, what is shown here is the black colored serpentine tubes so that is your condenser coil so you can see uh, the in case of uh, the condenser coil your vapor refrigerant it enters from the top that is not shown here explicitly over here your vapor refrigerant enters from the top so here this is where your vapor refrigerant enters and it is going to come like this and so your and as it comes down when it comes down so so the vapor refrigerant it comes down like this it comes down like this in each bend okay and when it comes down it is going to in each row it is going to lose heat and it is going to come down over here as liquid refrigerant so here it is refrigerant vapor and when it comes down it is refrigerant liquid so the flow of the refrigerant is from bottom to top whereas the flow of air that is going to be from bottom to top so the for the refrigerant vapor for the refrigerant the flow is from top to bottom and for air it is going to be from bottom to top why it is so the air as it absorbs heat it is the it's going to get warm and you know the warm air has got lesser density when compared to the cold air so the warm air tends to rise up whereas the cold air tends to settle down so you can see that the warm air rises up so and the cold air which is there it's it will absorb heat from here and it will also rise up, uh, rise up and leave so that is a natural convection air cool condenser okay so that is what is being explained here so the rate of heat transfer in natural convection this is going to be slower because it is natural and therefore it requires a larger surface area so that is the disadvantage of using a natural convection air cool condenser okay however the it can be used in a uh, very small capacity applications like domestic refrigerators freezers water coolers and room air conditioner where, where the capacity is very very small so this is a natural convection air cool condenser and there is also forced convection air cool condenser so if you are going to use a fan to blow the air from the bottom to the top then you call it as the forced convection air cool condenser and that can be classified once again as base mounted air cool condenser and remote air cool condenser if it is going to be base mounted all the fans the, the fan the compressor the motor receiver all the controls they are going to be there at the base and together they are called as a condensing unit so all of them they are resting on the same base so it is called as base mounted okay and these are used in very very small units okay where the compressor is belt driven with the help of a motor and the fan so both of them they force the air into the condenser and are mounted on the chain shaft who is who is mounted on the same shaft the motor which is running the compressor so the motor compressor and fan all of them they run on the same shaft okay and this is limited to the indoor units where you have a 3 kilowatt capacity motor and the refrigeration capacity is 
uh, 10 ton of refrigeration or less. So only in small capacity refrigeration systems, you go for base mounted air cooled condenser. In case of a remote controlled or, or, a, or a remote air cooled condenser, it is used on systems about 10 ton of refrigeration up to 125 ton of refrigeration. And this can be either horizontal or vertical and it can be mounted inside or outside the building. If it is going to be outside the building, it has to be placed on a base. So you have to have a, uh, it has to be mounted on something, okay? So it can be either on the rooftop or on the side of the building, maybe on the portico, okay? So in those cases, you, you, you can mount them outside the building. If it is going to be outside the building, then you have to use propeller flans for uh, the uh, which has the low resistance to airflow and free air discharge and it will require 18 to 36 meter cube of minute of air for a tunnel. This is the quantity of air that can be supplied with the help of this particular condenser. OK, so you, you if it is going to be placed inside the building, then you require ducts. OK, so duct design, we have already seen that in the class, so you will be requiring ducts to restrict the airflow and cause it also causes high pressure drop okay and you you need a centrifugal fan to move the necessary amount of air inside against the airflow resistance so that is where the remote air cooled condensers come into picture whether it is placed outside the building if it is placed outside the building then you need propeller fans to uh, pump in air uh, and discharge air outside the atmosphere uh, whereas in case of if it is inside the building, then you need centrifugal fans to move the necessary amount of air and you will have, uh, uh, you need the centrifugal fans to overcome the air flow resistance. But it's going to be outside the building, you will have a natural flow. And so that natural flow may uh, help you in uh, uh, with a with reduced uh, resistance to air flow. Okay, so where your propeller fans can be used. So you have air cooled condensers, so that can be natural or forced and if it is going to be natural uh, forced convection either it is a base mounted forced convection air cooled condenser or it is going to be a remote air cooled condenser okay so the source is from a textbook of refrigeration air conditioning by rs gurney and jk gupta so you can refer to the textbook for for the details as well okay so in the next lecture we will talk about water cool condensers and evaporative condensers thank you